Hey everyone and welcome to the Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes we will swim through the river of time to try and find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode, we examine the events that occurred July 6th. It was a hot day in Hartford, Connecticut, and to escape the heat, people did what they do and went to be surrounded by large amounts of other people in a cramped space known as the circus. The matinee performance of the Ringling Brothers' Barnum & Bailey Circus, which we have spoken about in a previous episode, was in full swing as trapeze artists swung around the tent ceiling while clowns and animal trainers performed their spectacular feats on the ground, drawing in and entertaining customers of all ages. Popcorn! Popcorn for sale! Popcorn vendors yelled while simultaneous calls for Peanuts and Cracker Jack led many to wonder if they would ever be back. Alfred Court, one of the circus world's most remarkable animal trainers who was known for working lions and tigers and bears, oh my, had just performed his three-ring display. This particular show involved using the Big Tent's three performance rings. The rings were filled with large cats and a mixture of 23 animals. The show was impressive and delighted over 6,000 people in attendance. With the audience's applause, Court made his exit, and the Flying Wallandas took the stage. The Flying Wallandas were, or rather are, renowned aerialists and are another of the most iconic performers in circus history. Founding member Carl Wallanda began performing in circus acts with his family at German beer halls. By the 1920s, he and his family were performing a four-person, three-level pyramid, which consisted of two men on bikes carrying a bar that Carl would be on, with the fourth person standing firmly on his shoulders. It would be this act that would attract the attention of John Ringling, who would invite the family to be a part of his famed greatest show on earth. The performance of July 6th was gearing up to be just another one for the books as the Wallandas took position on their high wire when something happened. The year was 1944, and on this day, July 6th, the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus Tent caught fire, killing 168 and injuring 487. This would become known as the Hartford Circus Fire. While we aren't really sure what caused the fire, it's widely believed to have been a fallen cigarette. The theory is that someone tossed a cigarette near the partition to the men's toilet, which resulted in a small fire which made contact with the tent and quickly spread. But why would the fire spread so quickly? Well, aside from the fact that that's just how fires do, it had to do with the weatherproofing that the canvas tent had received. For you see, in order to waterproof it, they applied a coating of paraffin wax and gasoline. This, as you can imagine, is incredibly dangerous and incredibly flammable. The fire was noticed by one of the performers who screamed, The tent's on fire! prompting band leader Merle Evans to launch into a rendition of Stars and Stripes Forever. This was their safe word song, the one to play when something was terribly wrong. According to witness testimony in scholarscollaborative.org, the fire began small but soon grew into an inferno eating everything in sight. Ushers attempted to put out the fire but were only burned in the process. Audience members began to run, bottlenecking the exits as flames reached 100 feet in the air, all while burning patches of tent rained down from the sky. Alfred Court's animal tunnels and cages from the previous performance were still in place, and as such, thousands of people were piled up against them, which caused more blockage to the narrow exits. The panicked masses, desperate to get out, then began to cut holes into the canvas to allow for their escape. Smoke obstructed the view and kept many from escaping, however. It also caused many to run into each other or even further into the danger. The Wallandas were able to lower themselves down to the ground and evacuate, but as we already know, many others were not so lucky. While response time for first responders was remarkable, they were powerless to stop the flames as the fire just moved too quickly. 
it would only take 10 minutes for the canvas tent to burn down. When all was said and done, 168 were killed, 84 of which were children, with injuries ranging from 4 to 600, but are generally considered to be about 487. Injury would understandably come from burns and trampling. Court would blame the safety code that was then in place, stating that the number of exits were just too few for the size of the tent. He claimed to have complained about the narrowness of the corridors, further claiming that his helpers barely had enough room to move between the bleachers and the tunnels, putting them at risk of being attacked by the cats that were in the show. So, while it was concluded and accepted to be an unfortunate accident, there were some thoughts that it could be arson. One man, Robert Segui, a man with a criminal past that included being labeled as a pyromaniac, actually confessed to starting the fire as a member of the lighting crew. Segui confessed this when he was 20, putting his age at 14 when the fire took place. The Connecticut Fire and Police were skeptical of this confession, however, and declined to charge him with arson. The fire would be investigated again in the 1980s, and it was theorized that the fire could not have started on the ground by a cigarette because the grass was not burnt due to the humid weather. This actually drew attention back to Sagi, but there were contradicting statements, and no witness could actually place him at the circus that day. Because of this, the case was officially closed September 10, 1993. On July 6, 2005, on the 61st anniversary of the fire, a memorial dedication ceremony was held, marking the exact location of the disaster. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.